possible to change it later? Yes, yes, that we can do it. Okay, okay, great. Okay. So I'll just go live in YouTube then. Sure, Lejo. Okay. So you may start now. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcoming you all uh, to the 36th session. Uh, so already one session is being given by Schrodinger today by Pratesh, and we'll be continuing with the second session from Schrodinger by Sudarshan. Uh, myself, Giri, one of the coordinators for Drug Discovery Hackathon. So kindly do not share any of your personal details during this meeting, and uh, all of you kindly type your questions in the live chat. And uh, today the topic will be molecular simulations in pharmaceutical formulation and introduction and will be given by uh, Sudarshan from Schrodinger. Over to you Sudarshan, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. You can share your screen. Do you see my screen now? Uh, not yet. Sure, uh, you're not seeing it now. I can, yes. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sudhasan Pandian. I'm a senior scientist working for Schrodinger. Um, so, today we are going to speak about computer aided pharmaceutical uh, formulations or computer aided pharmaceutical uh, non design formulation design. Uh, so, we've been listening to many lectures now on computer aided drug design and how do we design a drug molecule using computer tools. As well as today, Pratesh introduced you to um, how biologics can be designed, antibodies, antigens can be modeled or uh, predicted or you know, even designed using uh, computer tools. Now, I'm going to show you a few case studies of pharmaceutical formulations design. So why pharmaceutical formulations is important? Um, as you know, in any mm, not drug, develop, uh, drug development process, uh, in the preclinical stage, it's not only the drug molecule that, that matters, the way we are going to um, you know, deliver it to the site of interaction, that's a through formulation. So the formulation plays a crucial role in the, in the pre um, clinical trials. So we have to understand how this drug molecule is interacting with its uh, excipients and also before going into the body, what kind of uh, known degradation or, or chemical or physical degradation process it is going to go through, how we can block that and how can how we can control it uh, by designing right kind of pharmaceutical formulation. So that's where uh, you know there are a lot of problems because when we speak about uh, drug discovery, it's one glory molecule. So we run behind one molecule that's, uh, that's having a particular activity towards uh, protein. So once we have that molecule, how we are going to take that molecule inside the body and deliver it at the right site of interaction. That plays a crucial role in any, any clinical development. So for that matter, uh, we have to use, uh, we can use computer tools and I'm going to show you a few case studies on how uh, we can we can do that one, especially in the context of India. So India is becoming pharmacy of the world. We are we are exporting more and more uh, non-generic drug molecules from India to, to no other part of the world. You can see like about 31 percentage goes to North America, especially to USA and Canada. And uh, we basically export to all over the world. And it's about $18 billion by the year 2018 and expected to grow up to $25 billion in next three years time. So that's a huge business. And this is where Indian uh, pharmaceutical companies make their money to invest even in their drug discovery programs. So this is where we make our money. And then this is, this is the money which has been subsequently used for drug discovery programs as well. So that's why in India, especially pharmaceutical formulation development is, is a very, very important topic, especially when people are looking for job and stuff like that. It, it is very important to know that uh, what kind of work that has been happening in the, in, the, in, the, in the industry and this is exactly what is happening in the industry. OK, so and also the second part, why Indian companies are not very keen on developing new drug molecules because the cost of developing new pharmaceutical drug is beyond two point five billion dollars. That's um, you know, more than 15,000 crores Indian rupees. So that's kind of a very big budget for any Indian pharma company or any Indian company for that matter. So that's why we do the early development and then we 
tie up with with any of the big pharma companies from western world and try to develop that molecule at beyond some time so they give the give the complete uh, rights to the big pharma company and move away from that particular project uh, so they work on other projects so that's why from india we still don't have a drug molecule because we can't spend really this big amount of money so we develop this uh, you know we develop uh, the molecule at the earlier stage and even the formulations we develop in here then we uh, license it to big pharma companies and uh, move on to the next project that's how indian pharmacy or indian pharmaceutical industry survives uh, for the last two, two decades or so okay so what are these generic drugs the generic drugs which are you know coming out of uh, you know which came out of uh, you know uh, the patents so now anybody can produce these drugs but when when people uh, take the you no know, pattern on the drug molecule it's not only the drug molecule they take pattern on they take patterns on the formulations they take uh, the pattern on process and methodology so how they process and method you know, methodologically develop this formulation or this particular tablet or injection whatever they they know what are the form of formulation they develop so they take pattern on not only api formulation as well as the process and methodology in which they develop it so we can have patterns multiple patterns of our given tablet or given any formulation so it is indeed um, you know, companies interest to develop new formulation out of this patent so that they can um, you know sell this generic drugs in, in a unique way or in a new way to the to the same uh, or are you not know, discounted price in the, in the western world so if you look at um, how you know branded and generic drugs percentage of, uh, um, percentage of rates deviate compared to india and globally you can see india is probably the cheapest place where you can find the generic drugs that's why we export a lot of um, you no know, drug molecule from generic drug molecules from from india or generic formulations from india so this is where indian companies make money their money so that's why it is kind of very key for indian um, you know students or indian researchers to understand what kind of uh, scenario we are in and where we can find right kind of opportunities and when we speak about the formulation development so there are different types of formulations that are possible as i said the tablets capsules liquid oral syrup yeah topical products uh, yeah even we can develop the new technologies like patches and you know um, new new embedding technologies um, and yeah so there are different ways of uh, formulations that are possible and indian companies do develop all these different varieties of formulations in india so there are many companies there are more than uh, 25 leading companies which develop formulations uh, and and uh, patent them and even pass on that information to the western co- uh, countries so when we when we speak about the formulation uh, formulation is a melange it's, it's a mixture of many components api is one of the component active pharmaceutical ingredient which is which might uh, you know go from 5% to 80% but sometimes most of the times it, it it falls within the range of 5% to 10%. So the remaining 90% of the any formulation you take it, it could be tablet capsule or even injection the remaining 90% comes from this other excipients. It could be a surfactant, drug carrier molecule, solvent, anti-solvent, enhancer, flavoring agents, you no know, sweetener, um so yeah, antioxidants. So these things really protect this API molecule at the, at the at the package and then when once we take it uh, swallow it inside or once we take it inside our body so this api has to be released under the right conditions and the right place so they can reach the target um, within the you no know, given uh, period of time so for this uh, release pattern uh, to understand this release uh, pattern and also uh, develop the right kind of pharmaceutical formulation we have to have complete understanding of our api as well as we have to have uh, uh, sufficient knowledge on all these components which which we want to add to our formulations so how we can use computational tools to develop this kind of uh, components for our formulations using um, you no know, simulations that's what we are going to discuss now okay so yeah when you look at uh, the drug this drug development process so we have the discovery we have the product characterization and formulation on how the delivery is going to be pkpd studies then you do all the preclinical and go for your ind or uh, ind enabling studies then you go for the clinical trials so the, the the more amount of time you spend on a particular project the more amount of money or the cost which you are incur um, during the process so the the failure if if it is happens at the later stage it means you are going to lose a lot of money so it's better to start uh, the you no know, process of development um, even the formulation development as early as when you have the lead molecule or the lead candidates which are in then the same class so we can we can start thinking about a uh, working kind of formulation or working kind of delivery process which we are going to set up for this given molecule so companies do develop something like that so because of that they save a lot of money so when we have this kind of earlier uh, understanding of basic structure of what our ap is going to look like then we can already start working on you know using computational tools to what kind of process can be set up what kind of um, pharmaceutical formulation can be uh, you not know, designed for the given ap molecule okay so 
when we speak about uh, material sense feed, material sense feed is a, is a multi domain application where, where we have sort of tools. These tools can be applied in completely different contexts in different industries. So we will we apply the same kind of tools in organic electronics, polymers and composites, semiconductor uh, and uh, no LED, um, atomic layer deposition for the no the, the semiconductors and, and, uh, uh, and um, <clears throat> the processors, computer processors. So it, it goes from uh, industry to industry. But when we look at the fundamental understanding of all these properties, it boils down to uh, basically the electronic structures of the molecules as well as the chemical and physical interactions of molecules uh, at, the, at the atomistic level. So if we can understand things at that level, if we can expand that uh, no, understanding to the macroscopic level basically we can explain anything that is happening in the real life so it could be from any industry it could be from any kind of you know uh, research area but if we can understand the materials molecular level interactions we can basically explain things that are happening at the macroscopic level why a particular thing is working why a particular thing is not working why things are happening in the way they are happening from a molecular perspective would, would allow us to have a completely new perspective on our problem so that we can design new molecules and new materials for the, for the given problem. So that's the whole co uh, context of using metal science suite for pharmaceutical formulations and delivery. So what are the usual problems people face in the in the pharmaceutical formulations? When it comes to uh, pharmaceutical formulations, you come up with the APA molecule, which is already given. So once I have an APA molecule, then I have to decide on what kind of uh, dosage form I'm going to choose. It's going to be liquid dosage form. It's going to be solid. If it is a solid, what kind of solid dosage form is it going to be a tablet? It's going to be a capsule. So uh, these are the things which has to be decided. Once we decide these things, there are usual suspects for each category. So from these usual suspects, we have to choose the right kind of excipients. Choosing excipients is, is, is an art um, because there are uh, different people use different kind of methodologies, different kind of ideologies to choose their excipients. Using molecular simulations also, we can choose the right kind of excipients. So that's a, uh, I'm going to show you an example there, choosing the excipients, how we can choose excipient if you have an APA molecule at hand. And then understanding the role of the excipient. For example, I already have a formulation developed. So now I want to understand why this formulation is working, how this formulation is, you know, is, is, is giving the right kind of, you know, interactions and uh, what are the role of each and every component in this uh, formulation. So what is the role played by each and every component and what happens when I change the concentration? What happens if I completely leave off that particular component? So these are the things which we have to understand. So understanding the role of the excipient is also plays a crucial role in the, in the, in the uh, pharmaceutical formulation development. Then the physical and chemical stability of the formulation. When we speak about the physical stability, we are expecting a clear solution. Instead, we are getting a turbid uh, fluid. So where is this um, no turbid fluid is coming from? Our turbid precipitation is coming at the bottom of the beaker or bottom of the bottle. So where it is coming from? How long it's going to be stable like this? How long it would take for the given molecular species to aggregate and form a you know, nanoparticulate? These are the physical stability problems. When it comes to chemical stability, there are component A and component B. A component A could be our APA molecule, which could interact with the B chemically and induce a small chemical reaction. So what kind of chemical reactions are possible between them, even if they are possible? So how long it would take for them to form a noticeable quantity of uh, impurity? So that's the chemical stability problem. So how can I address the chemical stability problem? So what kind of, as I said, uh, there are um, no six or seven different components that are there in the excipients. So when they interact with one another, there are chemical reactions that are possible. If the chemical reactions that are possible, so what kind of impurities that can come out? If the impurities are coming out, we have to profile these impurities and then uh, quantify them. How long it would take for them to form a notifiable quantity of uh, impurity? So that has to be addressed. That's called impurity profiling. That's a kind of one of the main tasks in, the, in the, any kind of formulation development. It usually takes a lot of time. So if you can address that one using a molecular simulation protocol, that would really help uh, the formulator to uh, come up with a nice kind of idea to avoid this kind of uh, impurity formation. And also understanding the self life of the formulation. As I said, again, the impurity is, is usually the case where it allows um, no particular formulation to be used only for a certain period of time. So if you can have a better understanding of our uh, our uh, chemicals in the, in the in the formulation, we can def definitely extend their self life. Also, also, we can understand what would be the ideal self life for the given formulation also. So these are the usual problems which people come up with the uh, uh, pharmaceutical formulations. I have examples for um, these problems. I'm going to show one by one what how we are you now using molecular simulations to address this kind of problems. OK, so here is choosing excipients for formulation. OK, so in this case, it's a amorphous uh, solid dispersion. So we have a drug molecule, which is an ibuprofen molecule, and then we have a drug carrier molecule. 
so we have to choose a drug carrier molecule. As I said, if, if when you start your uh, pharmaceutical formulation project, what you would have is your APA molecule, your drug molecule. In this case, ibuprofen is a drug molecule. Now we have to choose a drug carrier molecule for the amorphous solid dispersion. You know, uh, it's, it's, going, it's going to be solid dosage, right? So we have to find out the drug carrier molecule. So the drug carrier molecule and the ibuprofen molecule, when you are putting them in a solvent or when you are putting them in an environment, they have to have a favorable interaction at all times. So they should not phase separate, even in the solution form. When you take a tablet and then uh, with, the, with the water, the drug carrier should protect the drug molecule till it reaches uh, into, into our intestines. So for that matter, the drug carrier should have a favorable interaction with the with the, with the drug molecule. And also it should not um, I'll say, uh, allow this molecule to uh, go out of the, the interaction interaction limit. So for that matter, we need to select uh, the drug carrier molecules which are having right kind of miscibility towards the drug molecule. So if you look at the drug carrier molecules under consideration here, we have PVP, Lutrol F68, Maltose, Sorbitol and Zalita. So these are the five drug carrier molecules that these are under consideration. So now when we want to calculate the uh, miscibility between these two, two components, so we can calculate them using experimentally or, or using simulations. Using simulations, what we need to do is we have to build a, a disorder system or, or a amorphous system. In the amorphous system, we can do a equilibration simulation, MD simulation, and in the completely equilibrated system, we can calculate the solubility parameter, Hildebrand solubility parameter, which is based on the uh, um, which is based on the cohesive uh, cohesive energy of the given molecular system. So for the ibuprofen molecule, here is a calculated value from the simulation. And here is the calculated value for the carrier molecule. In the column four, you have the calculated value for the uh, drug carrier molecules. Same is true for the experiment in the column five and column six. This is for the ibuprofen molecule. This is for the drug carrier molecule. So the difference between them, the delta um, solubility parameter is given in column <coughs> six, uh, column seven and column eight. You can see this is from the simulation. This is from the experiment. You can see the thumb rule is, so if the solubility parameter difference between in these two components are less than seven, that means they are going to be miscible. So here it is. So these two components, which are less than seven, so they are going to be miscible. Experiment also you can see. So these three components, which are not going to be miscible because you can see the values are high, so they are not going to be miscible. So like this, we can pick up the two components that are going to be miscible throughout the conditions. And also even when they are putting, when you, when you are putting inside a solvent or when you are putting inside a, you know, any other medium, these two components are having, going to have a favorable interactions. So they are going to be miscible all, all the times. So that's how we choose excipients. In this case, we chose the drug carrier molecule. The same way you can choose any other compound also, any other excipient also. So depending upon what kind of interaction you want your uh, excipient to have with your drug molecule, we can choose the, the right kind of component which, which falls within the range of plus or minus seven uh, solubility parameter value of the original drug molecule. So this is how we choose the excipient molecules using computer simulations. So here is an example study where we have two components, the two component drug, uh, drug by component drug system, the pink and the and the, um, and the cyan ones. So these two are uh, two different drug molecules having two different uh, solubilities, and these two components, green and uh, red, are two different solvents. So in a, in a binary, binary solvent system, they are happily floating around. You can see, so they are moving very fast because they are in the solvated phase. They are in their solvated phase. Because they are in the solvated phase, they are very happily moving around. So now in the beaker one, we have four components, solvent one, solvent two, drug one and drug two. So in the, in the respected uh, stoichiometric ratio, so now we take the beaker one and then pour it to the beaker two. In the beaker two, we have anti-solvent molecules. You can see the small red dots are the anti-solvent molecules where we have a big uh, drug carrier molecule floating around. So this big chain which you see is a drug carrier molecule, a polymer chain, a drug carrier molecule. Okay, so then you can see from compared to movie one, in the movie two, the molecules are moving slowly. Why? Because they have anti-solvent molecules. That means they have unfavorable interaction outside this bigger molecule. Or they have only a few favorable interactions compared to you know, uh, movie one. So that's why they are moving very, very slow in the movie two. And then you can see already they are starting to aggregate. In the movie two, uh, movie three, we completely evaporated the solvent molecules. So only the anti-solvent molecules are there. That means completely unfavorable interactions are out there. So now these molecule don't, molecules don't want to go out. They completely aggregated together. They were all trapped by a drug carrier molecule. You can see the big uh, drug carrier molecule is actually, you can see, see this is kind of very open in here. This drug carrier molecule is kind of forming a nice loop around this drug molecules. So this is how a nanoparticulate is formed 
in, in, in any situation of the non-visual formation or other non particulate formation. This is how the, at the molecular level the interactions are happening. So in this case, we chose how the solvents are going to be selected based on the simulations, solvents and anti-solvent. And the drug carrier molecule the same way using solubility parameter. Here we have a completed study. You have a nano particulate at the end of it where you have aggregated uh, drug molecules at the core of it. You have drug carrier molecules surrounding it. So this is how it is happening in the real life situation at, a, at the molecular level. We were able to mimic it. We were able to replicate it in the, in the, in the simulation. So we have a publication out there with, with, this, with this study. OK, yeah. So what do we need to do uh, to, to get do this kind of simulations? What do we need is the chemical composition. We have very beautiful disorder system builder within the framework of uh, materials and suite in storing uh, tools. So we have disorder system builder where you can add up to 100 different components. So you can go up to 10 different components by default. So you can add them in the, in the right stoichiometric ratio. So you can build your amorphous system. Then you can run using the multi-stage so multi -stage overflow. You can run uh, different types of equilibration simulation. You can do the analysis of your equilibration simulation and also completely get a, a model of your, your, your amorphous system at the molecular level. Here's an example study. So you have factory taxyl acid, which is our API. So you have other different components which are contributing uh, as, as, as excipients. In total, it's coming up to one gram tablet. So in this one, you can you can you can see. So this is the molecular weight of this particular component. From this composition and the molecular weight, we can convert them into number of molecules. So from the number of molecules, we can convert them into the total number of atoms in, in, in a system. So the molecular system, which has 100, approximately 118,000 atoms. So we can have this system where we can run hundreds of nanoseconds of MD and use a molecular level visualization to understand how these each components are interacting with one another. So how they are interacting with one another? What kind of interactions are there? So what happens if we change the concentration? What happens if we change the temperature? What happens if we change the solvent? So what happens when you have two particles and then put them together? Are they interacting within a, you know, as, as in two particulates or are they combining to other, together to form a single big particulate? So these kind of things which can be visualized at the molecular level would allow us to understand how and why we have to choose particular excipient. What is the role of the excipient? And how we can modify expensive excipient with a cheaper excipient. So this is one of the uh, model study which we did. And then when it comes to uh, chemical and physical stability of it, so here are uh, here is an example. Uh, we have a drug molecule here. We have a sweetener molecule here. They are supposed to be soluble in the water, but instead they form a precipitate at the bottom of the beaker. So what is this uh, precipitate and um, how we can address this precipitate? Okay, so how we can understand why this precipitate is Facility is coming at the bottom of the beaker. So we have a solubility parameter again. So we can calculate the solubility param parameter of all the three components. Water is the solvent. So two components, which is a drug molecule and the, and the sweetener molecule. So as per the solubility parameter studies, all of them are within the vicinity of the you know, plus or minus seven. They are supposed to be in a, in a single solution. Okay, so they are supposed to be in a single solution. Instead, uh, they are not forming a single solution. We have a precipitate. So when we look at the molecule, so you can see these two sides, these two particular sides, which are having potential um, oxidation states of the nitrogen. So the hydro atoms, which can which can have a uh, no charged species, which can have a uh, no uh, charged um, <coughs> charged nitrogens there. So that means potentially there could be an interaction that is possible there. So if we take this molecule and do a substitution reaction, remove this particular part on the top, and then add this component, replace it with this component, we get a product A. So replace this particular bottom part and then add this component here at the bottom, we get the product B. So is this kind of substitution reaction possible between these two components? So when we do the uh, reaction analysis from the you no know, thermodynamically, it is not a favorable reaction, but kinetically it is kind of within the uh, range of doable reaction. Maybe a small quantity of product A can be formed. Uh, when it comes to product B, it, it is not going to form because the, you can see it's, it's highly thermodynamically unfavorable and kinetically unfavorable also. So product A could form in, in small quantities. When we put these two things together, maybe we get out this particular component. Here's the computational IR spectra of this particular component. So if we take this component uh, and consider this could be our precipitate and run a molecular dynamic simulation and calculate its, its solubility parameter. You can see that's solubility parameter of 22 megapascal. So that's going to be precipitating. And here is a movie which shows when we start a random position, uh, this molecule dispersed in a water molecule, water box, 
and which in few nanoseconds they get aggregate and they form a precipitate. They form a now very big aggregate. So that indicates that this is not going to be miscible in the water and they're going to form a precipitate. And this is indeed being the precipitate at the bottom of the beaker. So we can we can address this kind of issues where we can try to see what is happening at the molecular level, why we are getting particular thing uh, at the macroscopic level can be traced back to the molecular level. Okay. Uh, and when it comes to impurity profiling, in the metformin synthesis, we have A plus B giving rise to C1 plus C2. C1 is our uh, metformin, which is most wanted component, but we have an impurity in, in the C2. So we want to find out the C2. So we want to find out the structure of this unknown impurity C2. So how do we find out the structure of an unknown impurity C2? So we have this reaction channel enumerator panel. Using this panel, you can say A plus B component, bring out all the possible association products. So it will do all the association. So for example, we do, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six different sites are there. So here we have one and two, two sites are there. The nitrogen is one side. These are uh, symmetrical molecules. So we have one plus one, two sites are there. Here we have six individual sites, six factorial into two factorial. We can get out about 1,440 associated products. But if we have any information about this impurity, we can avoid the number of simulations that we can run from 1,440 simulations. It could be mass of the unknown impurity. It could be fragment detail, like I have a methane group or I have an amine, um, amine group in my in my impurity or the functional groups or, or, or the, I have a six membered ring or a five membered ring or I have the total, um, you know, uh, molecular total number of carbons in my system. Any information about the impurity will, will reduce the number of simulations that we have to run. In this case, we know the mass of the C2 is equal to the mass of C1. That means they are of the same mass. That's why they are not able to separate them experimentally. So if, if you consider if they are of the same mass, so these are the six components which are having the same mass with respect to metformin. So this is our metformin C1 structure. So these are the five different components that have the exact same mass. So we have this beautiful panel called reaction workflow where we, have, we can plug in the reactant structures and the product structure, calculate the thermodynamical uh, favorable, uh, you know, therm whether the reaction is going to be thermodynamically favorable or not by calculating the delta G and delta H. Okay, so we can do the delta G and delta H calculation. You can see, so this is a major product. So here is our, uh, you know, this is, this is exothermic because this is going to happen automatically. There is one other product which is happening exothermically. So here is a exothermic product and that's our impurity. So this is our impurity. So this can be done within a week's time. So we can come up with the, with the, with the idea of profiling the impurity within a week's time. So you come up with the uh, reactant, possible reactants, we give you the possible products that can come out of the reaction. Okay, and understanding the self life of the, uh, you know, self life of um, any, any drug molecule or any formulation. So we need to know what kind of degradation process it is going to go through, right? So we can have the chemical structure using this chemical structure, using this bond and ligand dissociation panel, we can calculate what kind of uh, reactive sites that are there in the, in, in the given molecule. So when an electrophile is coming in, so where it's going to attack, when a nucleophile is coming in, where it's going to attack in the given molecule. So using Fuki indices, with Fuki functions, we can, we can really calculate what kind of interaction that can happen between incoming species and the, and the given APA molecule or excipient molecule. And finding the weakest bond in the backbone, so again, the bond and ligand dissociation panel, we can calculate the uh, weakest uh, back, uh, weakest link in the backbone where this molecule can potentially go, go through a degradation process and what kind of fragments that can come out of it. Then calculating the PKA, so we can do a site-wise PKA as well as a macro PKA to, to understand how this molecule is going to exist under a given pH conditions. So that would allow us to have better understanding of what kind of interactions are going to happen at the molecular level. So with a, the single molecular structure, we can do all these things using these three different panels and find out uh, basically chemically everything about that given molecular species. So that would allow us to understand what kind of degradation process it's going to go through, what kind of behavior it's going to have at, the, at, at under given conditions, and also what kind of uh, species can attack this given molecule to, to make a induce a reaction in, in that molecule. So this would allow us to have a better understanding of um, how this molecule is going to behave and how long it's going to be sta stable. Okay, so here's another example of understanding uh, the uh, exhibit component in, in the pharmaceutical formulation. So in the, in the movie A, you see um, beta cyclodextrin in, in a water, uh, in, in the water, water molecule. You can see for the first two nanos, uh, not 200 nanoseconds, they are floating around everywhere. 
and in the second molecule from 200 nanoseconds to 1200 nanoseconds you can see they tend to aggregate they form a nice aggregate there so beyond certain weight percentage they form this kind of aggregates so when it comes to below that critical concentration you can see so they are not aggregating they are happily floating around so what is the minimum concentration or the maximum concentration that that we can use for given component in a pharmaceutical formulation that can be understood using a molecular simulations you can see so here is an aggregate of a beta cyclodextrin here is a it's not aggregating at all it's it's freely floating around so what is the critical concentration so so this particular movie is at this concentration this particular movie is at this particular concentration you can see so without doing experiments what is the optimal concentration for the given component and the given solvent system or given formulation uh, can be simulated and understood what is the maximum concentration that is required for a given formulation and also yeah so liposim interactions so here is a molecule uh, drug molecule in the in, inside the you know uh, lip, uh, liposome molecule and then the coarse grain representation you can see so this is the these are the bilayer uh, surface and inside you can see these are the aggregates of the um, <clears throat> apa molecule you can see this strong aggregates indicate kind of crystalline lamellar form uh, formation inside the uh, liposome profile so once we have this drug molecule trapped inside the liposome so how they are interacting with the liposome how they are interacting within them so that can be simulated using coarse grain at the coarse grain level using Schrodinger simulation suites. So this is the original work performed using Schrodinger suite, which is going to be published uh, very soon in a, in a, in a good good journal. So to to put things uh, in, a, in a simpler perspective, so we can really use molecular simulations to understand uh, and, and and effectively design uh, right kind of uh, formulations for any given API molecule and to avoid uh, failure at the later stage. So it would, it would allow us to have a better understanding from the beginning. So how and what kind of molecular uh, species can be used as experience, and that would allow us to reduce the number of experiments, trial and error methods. We can um, rationally design new formulations, rationally understand our problems from the molecular context, and come up with the right kind of uh, solutions. So this is where I stop, and I thank uh, my team at Stodinger India for their continuous support. And uh, if you have any queries, as, as Pratish mentioned, please reach out to us in www.strodinger.com. And uh, again, you can find a whole lot of information about our online course, as well as other information about our other tools in, uh, in, uh, in our website. If you have any further queries, you can reach us, uh, reach us at help at strodinger.com anytime, 24-7. Uh, you'll be getting a reply within an hour. And thank you for your time, and thank you um, for the opportunity. Giri, over to you. Thank you so much, Sudarshan, for the insights on the formulations and others. Uh, I, ho I hope uh, 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 more of the pharma uh, pharmacy students and uh, the research will be getting used to this. Now we have uh, a few questions. Uh, let me quickly go through that. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the question is, can we get uh, BDE, uh, I think uh, bond dissociation energy and mm -hmm. HAE from any modules? I think you already talked about it. Or uh, do we need to justify using any literature survey? Come again. Um, uh, can we get it? can we get BDE or HAE from any of your modules using the software, or uh, we have to validate using literature survey? Well, we we get it from our software. Uh, we have validated it in a, uh, enough number of times already for um, no very very uh, very big amount of library, uh, very big amount of known drug molecules. Um, so. What you need is access to Jaguar. You don't need um, access to you know, plenty of softwares. You need access to Jaguar exactly. and the material science suite because the interface is uh, interface for that particular thing is built in within the uh, framework of in, uh, material science suite. Okay. And another question was like, uh, what is the kind of configuration do you require? For, because you had mentioned somewhere around one week. So what is the kind of configuration do you require? Well, uh, that particular work was done on a machine where we have 16 CPUs and a GPU. So that would uh, cost approximately around uh, two to three lakhs for uh, you know, for anyone to get a, a server like that. Okay. okay. So uh, uh, that's all for today, Sudarshan. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful session. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the members in the Drug Discovery Hackathon training team. 
uh, virtual tool room, CDAC, MyGo, and all the other partners who are joining together for this initiative. Uh, and also, I wanted to repeat again, like uh, the registrations for the virtual tool room, how to get access to the tools are already active. So if you go to the official drug discovery hackathon website, you'll be able to find register now. People have already registered also. You will get to access to this form and you can submit it. You can even choose more than one uh, software of your choice and then you can submit or if you want you to opt out, that is also possible. So these are the official links. Many of you have been already asking me and sending me emails regarding the registration queries. Uh, I let me tell you, I'm not the right person to handle registration queries. Uh, please write to this official email address, which is which you can see on the screen. That is ddh at aicte-india.org. This is the official email address that you have to send any queries related to registration. Most of you have been saying that you're being registered as an individual, but later you want to form a team and you couldn't do that. Please send a screenshot and email details to this particular email address. Um, the team will try to see what could be done there. And all the YouTube uh, uh, videos, that means the sessions, all the verticals are being already recorded. Sessions are already available in MHRD Innovation Cell. You will be able to see it. There are plenty of very good uh, uh, picked up uh, sessions already available. So please watch through them. And to come up, we have uh, to almost like two weeks to go. Uh, this week and next week uh, to go uh, with a lot of sessions so you can find the schedule in the NIST website also. So by this uh, I would like to also conclude today's session. Thank you all for your patience and uh, the participation uh, and uh, have a great evening and bye for now. Thank you.